Hey guys, and welcome to another Voyager update when it comes to the bankruptcy proceedings. We actually had some very, very interesting news that happened. If you guys watched my video yesterday that was more focused on Celsius, I did go bring up some of these topics. But we actually have some very big news when it comes to FTX and also uh, basically state regulators making comments in regards to the Voyager deal and also the chance that FTX may have to be investigated due to them offering potentially unregistered securities and as well the fact that this also may go and change up the deal or also maybe expand out the timeline of the actual FTX Voyager buyout and as well there's also been rumors too as well with other different types of offers being available more so in, in regards to the VGX tokens too we also have a lot of big information in regards to Steve himself who may also be subject now to a corporate clawback and on top of that too we also have the like day by day step by step also approval process which was very embarrassing to see on the 3AC process which was essentially what was caused the bankruptcy in the first place so we have a lot of things to go cover and if you guys do like these crypto things I would love if you guys would subscribe I'm trying my best to maintain as much information on Celsius and Voyager side the best I can. So let's go and dive into the video itself. So very first and foremost, I think the biggest news will probably be in regards to the FTX deal, which is about one or two days old at this point, but it's kind of roping all this stuff into one video. And this is in regards now that we're seeing the FTX Voyager deal, drawing a lot of objections, a lot of court documents, and a lot of investigations now from Texas itself. This is in regards now to the unregistered securities basically known as the EARN program, which has been shutting down BlockFi, uh, Celsius, Nexo from operating in America, and as well, FTX actually does offer a year, like a yield program as well. So number one, that's being somewhat scrutinized to see if that's even legal and possible and if they have the right banking laws for it. And then part two of that is also in regards to Voyager and if the Voyager basically buyout in bankruptcy, if it can be done legally, as well as also if these assets can be transferred over and basically making sure the deal is actually legally and regulatory sound. So, Texas is trying to add requirements to the FTX acquisition of assets from Voyager Digital, which is operating under federal bankruptcy court protection, claiming both cryptocurrency exchanges are not complying with state laws. And that's saying both. Both of those over there. Now, at this point, I'd probably say that Voyager probably was not operating in quite a few different things under specific laws. FTX, though, this is more newer news. And in theory, if they kind of based on how we that happened with BlockFi, etc., you need to have a very, very specific rule set and basically regulatory approval. And even now, after all these months, BlockFi, who's been applying for it, still has not gotten it. And they also were fined millions of dollars. So the documents filed in the bankruptcy case on Friday also revealed that FTX and its principals, including CEO Sam Bankman, and freed uh, fried are under investigation by the Texas State Securities Board. The state alleged in a limited objection to the asset purchase that FTX and Voyager are operating money transmission businesses without all the required licenses. So the Securities Board and Texas Department of Banking want language added to the sale agreement that specifies that Voyager remains liable for unlawful conduct and that offer occurred after the bankruptcy petition was filed, but before the sales transaction closes, and that requires that FTX to comply with state law before commencing business there. So this is kind of a big thing kind of going on because it actually may go delay the actual acquisition or also had some more state regulatory issues too. So hopefully this will not delay the process and hopefully folks will still be able to get their coins. But as well, there is still that big, big idea of the VGX. And that's why I've, I've, I've been kind of seeing, I've been following Shingo a lot in the Ethos project and I've been very happy seeing that they're still trying to do an airdrop for them. So I'm going to mention him a little bit. I'll probably put those links down below because there's, I mean, airdrops and free tokens. I want you guys to be involved with that. I think they're going to do more details sooner or whatever. Uh, I have a, I'm a VGX holder myself, so I hope they do something cool. We have an active application for the license, which has been pending, an FTX spokesman told Forbes, and believe we are operating fully within the bounds of what we can do in the interim, the spokesperson said, and the company has been in talks with the state for a while and plans to continue working with regulators there too as well. But also listen to the fact that actually uh, the parent company for FTX training too as well might also be having some issues where two other executives are being investigated for potentially offering unregistered securities in the form of the yield bearing accounts to residents of the United States too. It's kind of the same thing as I mentioned where they have like that 8% on the first $10,000 when it comes to that. So we're gonna have to see how this kind of evolves out there too. I think FTX is big enough and an industry leader that they could probably hire enough lawyers and be able to go lobby and or cut some good meetings with the SEC and you know all the other regulatory bodies, but it may potentially delay out the sales too as well. Now, as I mentioned too, uh, when it comes to the ethos creator Shingo, who's actually been very on top of the, uh, like the news for this too as well. So gotta give a nice little shout out for that one. There's been two big things. Number one, I want to bring a comment over here for the potential Steve uh, over here. We saw Shingo go and mention this tweet over here stating and showcasing where 
Uh, basically, the second amended plan notice of filing of second amended joint plan of Voyager holding holder digital holdings. Seems like there's a settlement now. Looks like the clawback of a $1.9 million bonus paid to CEO in February, but also includes full releases too as well. So it's intriguing too as well because it does seem like they want to go and claw back assets from him. So you guys, you guys read the legal documents. Pursuant of the D&O settlement, CEO shall unwind the transfer of $1.9 million received from the debtors on or around February 28th, 2022 by paying the after-tax amount of such transfer, approximately $1.1 million. I can't believe there's like $800,000 in taxes to the debtors in cash and assigning the right, if any, to any tax refund for the balance to the debtors or to the wind-down uh, entity as applicable. CEO shall subordinate his Class 3 account holder claim against the debtors until an all holders of claims are paid in full. CCO shall subordinate 50% of his Class 3 account holder claim against the debtors too as well. So very, very intriguing too is that they're basically allowed to receive their salary and benefits for as long as they work for the debtors too as well. But they're basically trying their best to push and say, hey, no, let's not go and do any of these big bonuses. Rightfully so, the business literally went bankrupt a few months later. And also that was also in regards to the 3AC. I don't think Steve deserves $2 million in bonuses, especially as of right now, because that also it's not a big, big percentage, but that could still be quite a few extra bucks coming back to the actual debtors too as well. And on top of that, too, it also does seem that they are not basically allowed to be in here. It looks like until January 15th, 2023, too, as well. We'll have to kind of go and see because I'm sure a lot of court dates always go and change quite a bit as time goes on. Now, as well, this is kind of another bigger thing, too, I want to showcase and hide over here where Shingo had a chance to put some of this stuff from page 44 to 50 on the cases in Stretto links, which if I yes, see this up on Reddit, I'll make sure to put this down for you guys. And this is basically the step by step of what happened with the 3AC loan. So basically, I'm going to give you guys a rundown. As described above, Voyager's business model contemplated generating revenue in several different ways, including by lending, in their business judgment, a portion of cryptocurrency held on its platform to institutional borrowers. So that's like uh, FTX they had deals on and also a 3AC in a few other locations. Voyager's lending business was described and disclosed in Voyager's public securities filing, which stated that we can earn fees from crypto assets, lending activities with institutional borrow borrowers, borrowers, including an unsecured basis, and that Voyager selects which and how much of its crypto assets are available for such lending activity. So basically, this is just saying that if you're in the, uh, the Rewards program, they want to rehypothecate their uh, crypto. So as of December 31st, 2021, Voyager held $6 billion in crypto assets on its platform, and then approximately 2.7 has been loaned to various counterparties as part of Voyager's lending program. At the time, the largest individual counterparty was Alameda, 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 I never know how to say it right, <laughs> for the FTX business and a crypto hedge fund funded by FTX CEO Sam Bankman Free, and was uh, also borrowed approximately $1.6 billion and represented 61% of Voyager's loan book too as well. So... And it kind of goes into other stuff, too, where they were trying to also diversify, probably to maintain these rates. In theory, if they would have just lowered the rates to like a 5 or 6%, and then maybe try to subsidize it with the trading revenue from the exchange, and then they didn't go and give a $600 million on the 3AC, they may have ended up in, like, they may have never ended up in bankruptcy. So 3AC was apparently well-known, prominent in the crypto space, and 2015 to 2020, 3AC experienced rapid growth and also had a lot of profitability too as well, but everyone can be profitable in a bull market. So basically, Voyager sought out a relationship. So basically, Voyager came to them, sought out a relationship with the firm. On February 7th, 2022, Voyager then CFO uh, Evan Parusbrus and Treasury Director Ryan Woolley had an initial call with Tim Lowe, an employee of 3AC's over-the-counter trading affiliate. They discussed 3AC generally, including its business objectives, made it its appropriate counterparty for institutional borrowing. 3AC advised that it had substantial interest given its size and investment philosophy. On February 11, 2022, Voyager and 3AC signed a mutual non-disclosure agreement to permit the exchange of confidential information between the firms as they explored a lending relationship. On February 13th, 2022, 3AC provided Voyager with a statement signed by one of its founders, Kyle Davies, containing only a single sentence stating that the 3AC NAV as of January 1st, 2022, was $3.7 billion. A single sentence. I wish I could get loans for hundreds of millions of dollars with just a single sentence. So unlike the other substantial borrowers or Voyager's assets, 3AC did not, for some odd reason, provide a balance sheet, audited or unaudited, in response to Voyager's formal due diligence questionnaire, 
3AC subsequently provided a description of its corporate structure, certificates, uh, certificates of good standing and incorporation, and a copy of its anti-money laundering policies. And this also with no collateral to as well. On February 28th, a Voyager team included Mr. Paulus, Paulus, I have no idea to say his name, uh, and also the other folks involved, had a due diligence call. And I'm surprised because this doesn't seem like a lot of due diligence with uh, Messrs. Davies and Lowe of 3AC. During the call, the Voyager team asked questions about the 3AC business and financial position and ascertained from Mr. Davies that 3AC managed only its founder's assets, which doesn't seem very true, was involved in limited high-risk venture capital projects, and its venture activities involved in Modest Sons. Uh, was largely engaged in arbitrage trading, which was delta neutral, and thematic trading limits to its own barring to 1x nav. It did not own positions larger than one-third of the circulation of any given altcoin to maximize its ability to exit quickly for such volatile assets too as well. In response to requests for greater financial transparency, Mr. Davies explained that 3AC only provided summary nav statements to its lenders and that it needed to treat all lenders the same as regard. This basically being like, I, I can't show you because I have to treat everyone else the same, but it's like, for $600 million, I don't care. Uh, when pressed, Messrs. Davies and Lowe explained that 3AC previously had a bad experience with the counterparty who had been given detailed financials information about 3AC, and according to 3AC, the counterparty had mimicked its trading strategy based on holdings information, disclosing these also documents too as well. So they basically, I'm not sure if they're lying or not, but it kind of, they're trying to play like, hey, no, we got you know screwed over by someone else, so I can't give you that information, but just trust us, we got $4 billion on hand. So basically the next day, they also had the same risk committee too, which had certain officers and other members of the treasury and legal teams had a regularly scheduled meeting to discuss, among other, other matters, Voyager's lending, trading, and staking positions. So during this meeting too, they considered the merits of entering a new lending position with 3AC and also the position in the market and everything else too as well. And they all thought that they were credible. Well, I'm still not sure how without any collateral as well. The risk committee discussed the fact that 3AC represented itself to have $3.7 billion in net asset values too, although though uh, no member of the risk committee objected to entering into a lending relationship with 3AC too as well. And at the end, CEO Stephen Elrich, in consultation with Mr. Paparutris, as described further below. So basically, you guys can see that there's just a lot of people just somehow not seeing these check marks that I think most common folks would. Maybe it was the greed for the earn program. I'm not sure, but uh, it does seem like there's going to be clawbacks potentially on the table, as well as also more assets for uh, debtors or creditors. And on top of that, too, we'll apparently have the now story with 3AC. So give me your thoughts and comments. Subscribe if you guys want, and let me know your thoughts and comments down below.